Okay, great. So I think most of you know who I am. Um, in case any of you don't, uh, I've been a Bitcoin developer now for about five years, since around 2010. And um, as part of the work I've done on developing Bitcoin over those years, I've done a lot of work on mobile wallets, um, lightweight desktop wallets and other things. And my project for the last eight months has been this Lighthouse project, which is a new specialized wallet for crowdfunding. And today's talk is going to be around 45 minutes, I think, I hope. Um, and uh, we, I want to talk about what Lighthouse does, but also how it was developed and some of the design decisions that went into it. And the audience of my talk is, of course, you lovely people. Thank you for turning up. But also I want to try and, you know, help people who want to write similar decentralized apps, uh, you know, learn from my experiences of doing this project. So that's why it's called a development retrospective. So the agenda is, um, we're going to go over what it is briefly. I'm not going to assume any of you have used it. Um, the design decisions, and yeah, advice and end questions. <coughs> so this is Lighthouse, that's what it looks like. It's a desktop app that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, it's a GUI app. It's a specialized wallet. You can see it gives you a Bitcoin address, and you can get QR codes, and it has a balance. But it's not a wallet like other wallets you've used, where it gives you a, a list of transactions and exchange rates and things. You put money into Lighthouse, so you can pledge it to a crowdfund. So here we have an example project, which is trying to raise money with Lighthouse called BitSquare. BitSquare is a project to create a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. Um, you can see when I took the screenshot, they're about halfway to their goal. Actually, they, they gave up yesterday because they needed, um, they had a timeline, they had a, a deadline associated with their particular project. They said they needed the money fast, otherwise they would not be able to pay their rent. So they're off going finding other jobs now. But you can see the idea, it's like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. You pledge money, and then the money can only be taken, the pledges can only be taken if the goal amount of money is reached. And unlike other systems like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, <coughs> Sorry, um, there's no middleman in this. This is using smart contracts, it's on the blockchain, and Lighthouse is an open source application that does not rely on my servers at all for anything except like auto update checks. Um, so you can see here, you know, I've actually I've made a pledge to this project. You can see there are a bunch of, they, they got up to about 55 Bitcoins, I think, by the end. Um, and then this yellow button here says revoke because the way you use Lighthouse is you send money to the app. Then you press the orange button when it says pledge, and you type in how much money you want to pledge to the project. And then you can undo your pledge and get the money back at any point without involving the project creators. So even if they vanish completely, you can always get your money back. Actually, the money hasn't left your wallet, but it's not obvious from the way the app works that that's the case. But you pledge, you revoke, um, up until, of course, the point where they reach their goal. And then they press the button, and it's labeled claim for them. And all the money moves to their wallet immediately. Right, so that's that's what Lighthouse is doing, um, and you can see, you know, it gives you a pie chart and, and ways to see who's pledging and, and stuff like that. <coughs> so I had some goals uh, for this project. Um, so the main goal was to allow crowdfunding without taking deposits. You could do this with Bitcoin before, of course, uh, but you would need to run a hot, cold wallet type setup where people are making deposits at your website, and then you process their you know, if they want their money back, for example, if they want to unpledge, you would have to give them the refunds and things, um, which is a problem. It, it's technically risky. You could get hacked. You could get scammed into giving a refund to the wrong person. Uh, you could hit legal problems because you're effectively being a bank or a financial institution. Um, so all these things are kind of annoying and risky. So I wanted to fix that. And I also wanted to experiment with crowdfunding of upgrades to Bitcoin itself. So like BitSquare doing a decentralized Bitcoin exchange is the kind of thing I had in mind. Um, also smaller things like protocol upgrades and so on. And I'll talk a bit about how that experiment is working out later. And then I wanted to do new ways of making decentralized apps. I had a bunch of ideas for how I, like my perfect decentralized app would kind of look. And no one was building apps like that. So I, I figured I'd do it. And then finally, you know, um, build the, I, want, I want it to be a showcase of what you can do with Bitcoin's contracts features. And from a political perspective, it's very nice when people say, what's the point of Bitcoin? You can say, well, look, you use Kickstarter, and by the time all those middlemen, banks, you know, Kickstarter, uh, Amazon payments, have all taken their cut, you've lost 10% of the money you raised. You try and raise $10,000 on a site like that, you'll only get 9000 maybe. Mm -hmm. But with Lighthouse, you get all of it, right? you ignore the Bitcoin exchange rate fluctuations. There are no fees to use it at all. 
So this is a kind of um, efficiency gain that you can get with Bitcoin. And this is the kind of thing where people say, oh, that's compelling. That's an interesting use case. Right? Maybe not a killer app, but you know, getting roughly in that sort of area of territory. And then finally, um, the, my main contribution to Bitcoin for the last five years has been a Java library which allows you to do Bitcoin stuff. So um, I'm using my own code and having fun. That was a big deal as well. Before, before this, I should mention, um, I was working for Google, and that was fun too, but I wanted to do something a bit different and uh, work on Bitcoin stuff. So the smart contracts feature that Lighthouse uses is probably not one you've heard of before. This feature has existed since the very first release of Bitcoin 0 0.1 in January 2009, but no one has really used it before. It's been inactive in the code base for, well, the entire history of Bitcoin up until now. Right? I think a few people made a few test transactions and whatever, but really no one's used it uh, for real. Um, and what this lets you do is you can, uh, normally when your wallet, I don't know, how, does everyone here understand the Bitcoin protocol or thinks they, they do? Yeah, right, okay, so mostly. Um, you could, when, when you sign a Bitcoin transaction with your private key, normally all of it is signed, which means that nothing can be edited in that transaction, or well, that's the theory, nothing can be edited. And that's why it's safe to blast your payment data out onto this peer-to-peer -peer network of random people, because they can't change anything about that transaction without breaking the signature. This say cash anyone can pay feature is a, a flag that you, you, when you make your signature, you tag onto the end, you say it's okay, for other people to take part in this payment. And what it allows you to do is merge transactions together into one big transaction. So in Lighthouse, a pledge is an incomplete, invalid Bitcoin transaction that takes money from your wallet and gives it to their wallet. But that transaction breaks the rules of Bitcoin because it's trying to send more money than it receives. Like you're attempting to effectively create money out of thin air, which only miners, <coughs> sorry, only miners can do in Bitcoin. But if you get enough of these pledges, and if you merge them all together, then you end up with a valid payment that you can broadcast and then go in the blockchain. So that's how it works. And as part of writing this app, I had to make a lot of different design decisions, and we're going to look at a, I don't know, six today and see what worked out. So the first one is, which people often go, what, really? It's not a mobile app um, or a web app. This is a good old-fashioned desktop app. It's like the 90s all over again. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, the UI, though, as you saw, it doesn't look completely like a traditional desktop app. It doesn't look like Microsoft Word. It looks a little bit like a web app, um, and that's deliberate. Um, it's a wallet that is not a wallet. You know, you wouldn't keep your savings in this. You wouldn't use this for buying coffee. But it is a Bitcoin wallet that synchronizes with the blockchain directly over the peer-to-peer -peer network. And it's, a, it's one with specialized features. So that's a bit new. I don't think there are... Other examples of this currently in usage? If anyone knows of one, let me know. Um, Lighthouse does not have an integrated project gallery or project search. And this was the very first design decision that was queried when the app launched on Reddit. You know, the first comment was like, it's empty. I, how do I find projects? Uh, the way you use Lighthouse is you actually find projects through web search, social networks, other things, projects or files. And when you found a project you want to support, you know, you download it and open it in the app, right, like a document. Um, and that's a bit old school as well. That's not something most people expect. So I'll talk about why that is. Um, it has two modes for projects. You, when you create a project in the app, it's got a little, like, wizard for the creation of a new crowdfunding project. You can pick server-assisted or serverless. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, and finally, Lighthouse itself, even though it's a decentralized app, does not actually create any new peer-to-peer -peer networks. It uses the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, but um, it doesn't like, have any other peer-to-peer -peer networks behind the scenes. And, but it does rely on a, an extension to the Bitcoin protocol, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so this, this sounds stupid, right? Desktop Java, are you crazy? Everyone knows these apps suck, right? Why, why would I do this? So, the main reason is that um, you know, the state of our industry is such that if you write a mobile app, um, for example, then you're going to exclude a lot of users. Here's the download breakdown for Lighthouse so far, a couple of weeks after launch. About half my users are on Windows, 30% on Mac, 20% on Linux. We are a diverse bunch in the Bitcoin community. We don't agree on anything, especially not what kind of devices to use. Um, for example, uh, you know, in Germany, um, the iPhone has around 10% market share, so it's not that big a deal. 
Uh, but in America, it has around 50% market share, so it's a much bigger deal. So if you're trying to do um, a client-side app, the nice thing about doing a desktop app is you write it once and you can actually hit almost all users simultaneously with almost no effort. And that's not true if you do a desktop app. Why not web app? Uh, well, uh, you know, HTML5 is not designed to build peer-to-peer -peer apps. This, I'm assuming this is obvious to everyone who here knows programming, but a whole lot of people do try and make decentralized peer-to-peer -peer apps out of the web. But it's just not designed for that. Like HTML is just, it just gives me a headache every time I try to get a layout working in HTML. Anyone who's designed web pages will know the pain I'm talking about here, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, very, very modern Java stuff, and I'm not talking about the stuff you know from five years ago, I'm talking about stuff that only became usable in the last 18 months, um, is actually very good. Um, I have used, in my career, nine different UI toolkits, I believe, and of them I think this one is probably the best. So it's very easy to design user interfaces this way. Um, and then, historically, if you wanted to do a desktop Java app, it would piss all of your users off because they would have to download and install Java, and that would set up stupid toolbars in their web browser, and it was just like a disaster zone. But they, they're, they're moving away from this approach now. And actually, the latest versions will generate like d bundled downloaded uh, packages and installers for, you know, you get a, um, an app folder on a Mac, you get a, a Windows install on Windows, you get a deb on Linux. And it's completely integrated and bundled. The user doesn't even know, necessarily, how it's implemented. Right? So they, it's just a big runtime library to, to users. They don't care that it's Java or even know. <coughs> um, web apps cannot be secure. Um, it's very hard to make them secure uh, with also having online updates. Right? If your web server gets hacked, then, then, you can, then the hacker can make your users run any code that they want, including code that steals people's keys and their money. Um, Lighthouse has a, I think it's the first in the world, actually, a multi-signature uh, online update system. So if you know the principles of multi-signature bitcoins, multi-sig addresses, this is the same thing, but for software updates. So in theory, if other people were willing to help me out with this, you know, we could have like three developers in three different countries, and two of them would have to sign in order to push an update to the users. But from the user's perspective, this is transparent and easy, and the app updates itself in automatically behind the scenes. So this is a good balance between the needs of security and decentralization, but the needs of, a, of an easy user experience as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, oh, in, and although I did use uh, Java 8 for this, you don't have to, you could do this like Python or Ruby or JavaScript or <coughs> Haskell. There's a dialect of Haskell as well, if you wanted to do this, like ba basically any modern language. It has downsides too, right? I'm not gonna lie about that. Um, so some, here are some of them. Uh, you know, it can look ugly. This is one of the traditional problems with doing apps this way. This is one of the reasons why Lighthouse looks a bit like a web app. Um, I don't want to get bugs filed against me saying like, this button doesn't look perfectly like a Mac button, or you know, this, you know, this menu bar is not a normal Linux menu bar on my desktop operating system of the week, my right? desktop environment of the week. Um, so Lighthouse does its own thing. It doesn't attempt to fit in with anything at all. Uh, and it sort of has a, a web-inspired look, but it doesn't attempt to look native. Um, another problem that you only realize when you actually go back to writing one uh, is that the, <laughs> like the web sucks so much that you kind of get immune to how bad it is sometimes. And when you do a regular old-fashioned app, you suddenly realize that users have higher expectations for these apps. For example, they want high-resolution icons. They want... Uh, the app to not crash if you're offline and you try and start it. Right? If you type in a web address, you'll just get an error message. They want undo. Uh, you know, how many web apps have you used that have undo? Online help, for example. Um, all these things are you know, expectations people have of old-fashioned apps uh, that they don't have of web apps. So that's another reason Lighthouse looks like a web app, to lower people's expectations um, <coughs> and keep the cost of development low. <laughs> Um, yeah, so people have to download it, that kind of sucks. It's a bit hard to measure the impact of that. Um, I had to do my own online update engine to you know, get something that was, can support multi-signature updates and other things. And then, um, yeah, so you know, I, th those of you who have developed on things like java.net will, will know about this already, right? They compile code as they run, and this has upsides and downsides. <coughs> but it, it makes it hard to optimize startup time. Lighthouse starts up in around 500 milliseconds to one second. And I tried hard, but I really couldn't get it any lower than that. It, the platform doesn't help. But 
you know, having done the app, having launched, having got users, having seen the feedback, uh, I don't regret this decision at all. This was the right decision. Uh, mostly because I could walk away completely and the app would still work. So I'm not tied down to being passionate about crowdfunding forever. Um, 10 years from now, you know, when I've moved on to other things, or 10 months from now, <laughs> when I've moved on to other things, uh, Lighthouse will still work and people can still be using it, even if I turn off all my servers and walk away, which would not be true of other things. So why a specialized wallet? Like I said, as far as I'm aware, Lighthouse is the first of its kind that has launched, but there are other examples of this. Uh, so BitSquare um, is an example of the this, this decentralized um, local bitcoins.com, effectively. It has an integrated wallet. You send money to the app to use it. Coinfeen is also like this. It's also a decentralized Bitcoin exchange that's got an integrated wallet. I, I wrote an app for about a year ago called Payfile, which is making micropayments for file downloads using smart contracts. Um, and that was the same thing. You had a file downloading client, like a BitTorrent type client, um, but it was client server. And uh, you sent money to the app in order to be able to download things. Um, and one advantage is this is a lot easier than you would think. Actually, the library I've written, Bitcoin J, it has a, a template app that you just copy and paste to get started. And, and it's so uh, quick to customize and package one of these. There's even a video tutorial showing you how to do it. You can do it in like half an hour, and you get like a, a Mac download out of it that's integrated and self-contained. Um, and it, you've got your own wallet, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Right? You just customize the UI to make your perfect wallet. Um, and doing it this way, you know, there's, I don't know about you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've, there have been lots of things that say they are decentralized apps um, being announced, being developed, coming out, and when you actually try and use them, what you tend to find is they're not really how you would expect. Like they say, we're decentralized. Log in at you know counterwallet.com or whatever, which is our you know web site bank type thing, right? And it feels like a bank. Um, and they say, oh, it's really decentralized because you could install all the components and set up your own web server um, behind the scenes if you wanted to, but it doesn't feel that decentralized to me. Um, so, you know, the advantage of doing it this way is it sort of feels more like I'm in control. If it's my wallet, it's running on my machine, um, then, then that has some nice advantages. And finally, <coughs> even though I'm tooting my own horn a bit here, uh, Bitcoin J has been used by now to do all kinds of contracts, smart contracts work, not just by me, but by lots of other people, by academics. Uh, doing research projects and things like that, and, and they've contributed fixes, and we've uh, you know got documentation. And by now, if you are interested in Bitcoin smart contracts, this is a pretty good uh, platform to build on. It's pretty easy to get started. Downsides? Well, there are always downsides. The Bitcoin protocol is, well, it's the first of its kind, right? So Toshi didn't have anything to refer to, so I'm not going to be too critical. It wouldn't. It's not what I would call developer friendly. Um, one example is the need to attach a fee to every, like a micro fee to every transaction to get it confirmed. This is um, annoying for end users because it's a fee, uh, but this is really has a big impact on code complexity when you're implementing these things. Because now um, you would be, you'd just be amazed at the level of complexity that fees add to what would otherwise be quite simple smart contract systems. There's not much we can do about this. Well, there are things we could do about this. Politically, it's not gonna happen. Um, and, and so, yeah, the downside of working directly with the Bitcoin protocol is it is a bit annoying. Um, doing a peer-to-peer -peer wallet does mean that you sync with the blockchain. Of course, this is much, much faster than Bitcoin Core, right? This is like if you install BitSquare on an iPhone, uh, no, not BitSquare, sorry, Thread Wallet on an iPhone or um, a Bitcoin Wallet for Android on Android, then you, you know that it takes a few seconds to catch up with the blockchain, right? Not hours, a few seconds, but it's still a few seconds more than instant, which is what we would like. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are, they're just a nightmare. <laughs> they're just inherently difficult to debug. You get bug reports saying like, I pushed a button and then it took you know two minutes for the thing to happen, but you can never reproduce it, right? Because it's to do with that exact, num that exact combination of peers that were connected to at the time, which is random. And you, logging helps, but it's, it's just very hard to, to debug things in this environment. Um, and then, yeah, finally, if you want to do a specialized Bitcoin wallet, um, there are only a handful of libraries you can use, really. Um, and uh, Bitcoin J is the best, but if you don't want to use this because you can't use the JVM or whatever, then um, there aren't a whole lot. You would probably have to use like blockchain.info as your back end, for example, there. So those are the downsides of doing things this way. 
So I think this worked out okay. This generates a big pile of bugs for me to fix and you know user reports to deal with, of course, but this is peer-to-peer -peer technology. That's what I've been doing for the last five years, so I know how it is. And for me, um, in 2014 and 2015, it worked out okay. I think that was the right decision. But it might not be the right decision for everyone, and it might not stay being the right decision. You know, we'll, we'll see how things evolve. <coughs> Sorry. No integrated gallery. Probably the most controversial decision uh, in the design in terms of the one that people ask me to change the most. Right, the reason for this is that decentralization and Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer stuff is horribly, horribly expensive to implement in terms of time. Developer time has is money, right? Um, it's just incredibly, it's just very, very difficult. Um, everything becomes thousands of times harder when you do it decentralized. Uh, all of our society's tools and infrastructure and all of the stuff we've built in our industry is oriented around client server, um, you know, big data backends with all kinds of stuff. And there's almost no tools to do decentralized apps. So what this means is, even doing very tiny features like um, gathering of pledges and, and you know, cr like the, the core crowdfunding idea, will we use up all of your budget. Um, I budgeted like four, four and a half months to do Lighthouse and I'm now way past eight. So, you know, I've blown my budget completely. And um, you know, I'm still like fixing weird edge cases and stuff uh, that crop up when you get thousands of users. So um, the main reason not to do an integrated gallery or search, oh, oh yeah, and I, I put an example here. So Bitcoin 0 0.1, how many, did, did anyone here use the very, very first version of Bitcoin ever released? Yeah, Chris, <laughs> one guy. <coughs> so Bitcoin 0 0.1 was a Windows only app, desktop app. Um, and, you know, it had functionality that you could implement as a web app in one weekend, right? Or it would be like my first web app, right? It's something like you would use it to learn programming as a student. Bitcoin 0.1 is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer Windows app, took Satoshi two years of design and implementation, and was an incredibly complex code base, and he had to implement new cryptographic algorithms to do it. That's, that's the blow-up in complexity that we're talking about. Right? The, the first Bitcoin 0.1 didn't even have passwords. That's how light it was. Um, and uh, Lighthouse has been s called lean. That's, that's a polite way of putting it. Feature light or lean. Um, and the reason is that, you know, y because of this, it, you have to really focus and prioritize very, very aggressively in order to get something launched. Uh, get something to the point where you can actually have users using it. Um, you have to be really brutally focused. Uh, now, and that means, and, you know, focused on what? What is the value add? What is the real benefit of decentralization? I'm not talking about ideological benefit. I'm not talking about we like the sound of it. I'm talking about the real end user benefit, which for Lighthouse is the movement of money, right? You, you, you fix the movement of money and you avoid all kinds of legal problems and hacking problems and lots of problems go away. Um, but the, doing a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized project listing service, that wouldn't make any sense. There's no value in that, right? What problems are you solving with that? So, that, so Lighthouse delegates all of this stuff to the community, and in particular develop, delegates all this stuff to web developers who are going to be better at this than me anyway, and who can build communities, they can compete on their communities, they can make specialized websites, they can, use, they can do everything from like forums, so the, currently the biggest project gallery for Lighthouse is actually a subreddit. I mean, it sounds stupid, right, but it's got commenting and voting and, and it's right there, so it's sort of a quick way to get started. But people could make slicker ones if they wanted to, and they could compete. So there's a competitive market of project galleries, and even though each project gallery individually is centralized, um, you know, because it's very easy to compete with them, you, what you end up with is kind of a decentralization of power there. <coughs> and the, the web is, maybe the web isn't great at doing peer-to-peer -peer apps, but it's pretty good at doing like documents and social and commenting and other things like that. So you know, you want each tool for its job. And just to, just to ram home the point here, of course Lighthouse, I said Lighthouse doesn't have an integrated gallery. That's not quite true. Um, when you load projects into it, you get like a mini gallery of projects that you've actually imported into the app. Um, this, is a <laughs> this is a video of my personal Lighthouse that I've been loading projects into in order to review them. So you can see we're scrolling through the projects here. The frame rate there is low for a second because of a bug. Um, so you can see all these projects that people have sent me 
And you can see how awful the integrated mini gallery is already, right? We're not even clipping the text, right? They're just massive walls of text here, and there isn't even a read more link to collapse them. That's something I'm going to have to add. This gallery is so basic that um, there isn't even a way to delete projects yet. <laughs> That's actually the next, one of the next features I need to do after you know, working my way through the bugs is just allow myself to clear out all of these projects that people have sent me. So you, know, you can see that each one of these features is small, but it all adds up, and that's just managing your projects you loaded. Adding search and other things on top of this, you know, forget it. Right? It would have doubled, tripled the scope of the project for no real value add. <coughs> and people who do um, decentralized apps need to keep this in mind, I think. Right? I see a lot of people trying to do decentralized marketplaces and decentralized this and decentralized that. And they often look to me like they're biting off more than they can chew. So even though this, this decision has been queried a lot, you know, people ask why is this and stuff, I, I still think that was the right call because I just saved so much time and money. Right? My patience for this stuff is not infinite. Um, but it's hard to get this decision right. So, so Lighthouse, the original plan when I started was because I knew decentralization is expensive and coding is expensive, I wanted, you know, I, I was so keen to outsource stuff. I said, actually, I even want to outsource the movement of data itself. Because a, a Lighthouse project is just a file, actually. It's a file that contains the cover image you saw, the description, and it contains um, the target output of the smart contract. So that's the script that controls, um, you know, the, 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 that contains the key of the person raising the money um, and the value that you're trying to raise. Um, and it can be a multi-signature script and so on. So it contains a little bit of transaction data. Um, so it's a file. And then a pledge is also a file. The pledge contains this partially sick hash anyone can pay signed transaction um, and a comment and, you know, your email address so the person crowdfunding can contact you. So these are just files. And I think, hey, you know, right? There are companies in the world that specialize in moving and storing files. They're good at it, right? They have things like reliable backup. They have high uptime. They have they encrypt their data at rest. They have two-factor authentication. They have password recovery. They have sharing. They have access control lists. They do a lot. So I figured, why don't you know we use them instead? Um, <coughs> and they're free. And anyway, almost everyone can either has one or can have one of these like drive things. So I wrote the app. Um, to, you know, to, to operate by watching directories on disk, and then the idea was, you know, pledges will pop in as they get dropped into these drop boxes, um, and then you know the, the app will just notice that a pledge has appeared, and like check it and show it to you. But it, well, you know, probably some of you are already thinking this sounds like a stupid idea. Um, as I was, you know, experimenting and implementing, of course, I discovered that the user experience of this is not very good. Um, for example, uh, drag and drop is intuitive to a lot of people within the context of a window. The drag and drop between windows is not. A lot of people don't even know how to do that. Um, so as I did a bit of testing and you know experimenting and user testing, I realized this this thing isn't going to work. You know, people would have to like save a file and switch window and then re-upload it. And it was just it didn't feel right. Um, <coughs> but I didn't scrap it. Um, what I did was I said I'll have you know what, I'll hedge my bets and I'll have a server assisted mode for project as well. And then I, ima I imagined writing a little server that was like a mini Dropbox, but like a really basic one that was more integrated with the app. Um, and that's how I started seeing it. And this turned out, it was a total disaster. Because you know what, like over time, this server assisted mode started becoming more and more different to a file storage system as people asked for features and alpha testers gave feedback. Um, and the two modes diverged, but they were written to share code paths, actually. So as these two modes became more and more different, but they were trying to share the same code, what would happen is like, there's just an explosion of bugs and complexity. And you know, I would make a tweak to the operation of one mode, and then like, the other one would break. And it was, it was just, there were unit tests in Lighthouse, but not all the UI stuff is tested. Right? Some of the UI is not like, auto-tested. So it just turned into a massive nightmare. And some of the bugs that are being reported to me with Lighthouse now are things like, you know, I clicked a button, and now I see all pledges twice, and then I restarted the app, and it's fixed. So it's like a UI sync bug. And some of this, a lot of these things, they trace uh, their root cause to this inability to just make a quick decision early on and say, you know what, that idea was a stupid idea. I'm going to kick that out the window and just go completely for the server-assisted approach. Um, because I was like, oh, I really want it to be as decentralized as possible. <laughs> but in hindsight, this was a bad decision. 
Um, the cost wasn't worth it. And really, what does this boil down to? Well, I should have done more upfront product design before I started coding. Um, the crypto coding part of this is actually the easiest part. The hardest part is figuring out exactly how you want the product's UI to work, what you want the user experience to be like. If I had uh, forced myself to implement the smart contract stuff last, instead of doing it pretty close to the start, because that's the fun stuff, right? Then I would have picked up on this problem much earlier and saved myself a whole lot of time. Lighthouse uses the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network for receiving and sending money, but it is not itself a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it's, so I'm talking about server-assisted mode, right? So it uses a web model for servers. So there are public project servers that at least those coordinate the collection of pledges. Sorry, I didn't explain what these servers do. Um, when you pledge in the app, you, you get this bit of data, but you have to get it to the person who's running the project somehow, and they are probably not online. So what happens is there's a little server that you upload the pledge to, and it keeps it around. And it also does things like <coughs> show people the current status of the project. Uh, it exports a JSON API so you can integrate it. You can have like a little ticker in your website showing how much money you've raised and things like this. So it does a few things. Um, and it, you, these servers, they're like web servers. They don't talk to each other or anything. They just host files. Um, they talk to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, but they don't host files. <coughs> so, you know, I did this and I was, you know, I thought really what we need is you create a project and then just automatically upload it to a server, right? And it becomes activated and visible immediately. But then, you know, I was running out of time towards the end of this project, towards the end of the project to get to beta, basically. And, um, you know, it was became clear that if this was the case, we would end up with servers that were absolutely cluttered with like hello world type projects, just not, they were never gonna go anywhere. And Lighthouse projects don't have a deadline, so there's no natural point at which you can delete this data. Um, and we just use up lots of resources and it just would be kind of annoying. Not to mention, I was also worried that people would create uh, projects that were clearly illegal, like, you know, let's raise money to kill the president or something. Um, and then, you know, th even though the server operator doesn't have any access to people's money, the server operator is not very trusted. They don't hold people's bitcoins. Um, you know, they, they might still get in trouble if they are helping coordinate one of these things. So most project submission uh, to Lighthouse servers is manual. Um, you literally, uh, you create a project and then it says, email it to this address, <laughs> and you actually email it. And it turned out this, this solves a whole bunch of problems. It sounds, again, it's, it's low tech, right? It's kind of old fashioned. You just, you get given a file and you email it to someone and say, please host my project, like a, a website in 2001. Uh, this solves all kinds of odd problems you wouldn't think of, like you get users who are confused, they don't really know what they're doing, so this allows you to help them out. Um, you get users who, uh, yeah, they're just like messing about. Um, you get people who, they make a mistake in their project, for example, um, and then uh, they don't realize that, and when the server operator does a quick review, they're like, oh, you know, you, you've messed this up. You, you're asking for like 10,000 Bitcoins, and you meant like 10,000 milli Bitcoins or whatever. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things where you could do all of this stuff automatically, and one day it will be automatic, but to start with, I cut all of that out of the app as well. Right? Again, this is the get rid of everything you possibly can just to get something launched uh, mentality. So the pro is, you know, um, if you, people who try and build new peer-to-peer -peer networks, they find it's cool for the first few days and then they discover like half of, their, uh, half of their servers have disappeared because, you know, people decided they got bored and they want to play games. Um, <laughs> yeah, some simplicity, uh, cutting features, you know, focusing on the core value add again. Of course, downsides are, uh, well, uh, you have fewer servers because they are more effort to run. You're relying on like professional sysadmins to set up these servers and run them. So there are four public lighthouse servers at the moment. And one of them actually has a web form where it will automatically upload a project. So you don't have to email and wait. You, you can go live immediately. And that's clearly the, the, the right direction to go. People have not been creating lots of illegal projects. You know, I was too conservative there. I'm, it's, it's not uh, been a real problem. So we can make this whole thing automatic and easier. So I think it's the right decision. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are notoriously tricky, and if you look at things like Open Bazaar, you know they've had a they came on heavily unstuck. Um, they've had they've had a lot of problems with trying to build their own peer-to-peer -peer network, and it's better if you can simplify that out. But uh, there was one minor thing with the Bitcoin wire protocol. So not the format of the blockchain, but the other ways the Bitcoin nodes talk to each other. 
the, uh, there, I needed another feature in it. Um, and the reason is when you receive a pledge, when someone uploads a pledge, the threat model, uh, the security model in uh, Lighthouse is that server operators are sort of slightly trusted. They see some private data and things. Um, we don't trust them to hold Bitcoins, but they're slightly trusted. People submitting pledges are not trusted. They can be, they can, they can be arbitrarily malicious. So for example, you could get people trying to submit pledges for money that doesn't exist, money that does exist but isn't theirs. Right? They can submit invalid pledges. So Lighthouse needs a way to check. And it may surprise you to learn, it surprised a few people I mentioned this to, but the, the Bitcoin protocol actually did not have or does not have any way to look up entries in the ledger. Um, you can download the blocks and calculate the ledger yourself, but just looking up an entry in it doesn't work. Um, that's a problem if you want to check a pledge. Normally it doesn't matter because you, know, you just sort of connect to a bunch of nodes and if you receive a transaction from all of your peers, then you can guess it's probably valid. But a pledge is an invalid transaction. It's not finished. So you can't do that. So you need this. So I implemented this in C++. It's part of Bitcoin Core. <coughs> it's a very small feature, by the way. Looking up an entry in the ledger is a core Bitcoin operation. So you can imagine it's not very complicated. 44 lines of code, uh, 167 comments on GitHub. This was a complete circus, right? So many of these comments by the end had not even, they were written by people who had not actually read the earlier comments. So the whole discussion started going around in infinite circles because people met making the same points over and over again. <coughs> Some of them were asking questions that were even answered in the description of the change, but they hadn't read that either. <coughs> Sorry, so actually it did get merged despite this ridiculous circus. But a few days later, it got deleted again from the Bitcoin code on the grounds of this is a shitstorm. Um, there were not like technical arguments about this. They were mostly philosophical things like, you know, um, are lightweight wallets a good idea? Right? That is a, uh, something that you would expect, given they're very popular, to not be controversial. But if you think that, you have never encountered the Bitcoin core development community. Not the, my feature was not the only feature that has met this fate, by the way. Another one called Double Spend Relaying has had exactly the same experience. This is a feature where uh, normally the Bitcoin nodes will ignore double spends. So if you want to know if someone is trying to double spend against you, you have to like connect to about, like, thousands of nodes to try and detect if there's um, a double spend propagating across the network. This is very inefficient. Right? You use it, each connection you make to the peer-to-peer -peer network uses up a bit of memory and CPU time. And there's a limited number of connections. I mean, it's a finite resource. Uh, so double spend relaying is a feature where we change the network so these double spends get moved around and propagated around as well, so you can detect them. Um, but that didn't make it either. And actually, that was written by Gavin Andreessen, right, who is the uh, guy Satoshi left in charge of the Bitcoin project. But he wrote this feature, and he implemented it. It got, it got merged again. It was committed. And then Gavin went on vacation, and someone else with commit access deleted it again, like some kind of Wikipedia edit war. So this is, this, is, this, is big, this is a problem, right? So I would call the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol dead at this point. Well, I would call it that. There's a few people who have commit access who are still, you know, they can probably do things with it. <coughs> but actually, it's not even me who says that. It's a maintainer of Bitcoin Core who said, uh, nobody will work on the protocol now. Mike has been chased out of town with pitchforks, which is a very colorful way to put it, but also completely accurate, right? I think you would have to be, well, you would have to have a lot of patience, uh, a lot more patience than me to try and take part in this process. And this lightweight wallet mode that, you know, if you've ever used Multibit or Bitcoin Wallet for Android or Thread Wallet on iOS or a bunch of other things, if you've ever used these apps, you've used SPV mode. You may not have realized that SPV is a simplified payment verification. So it's a way to use the blockchain without the full resource requirements of running the original Bitcoin stuff. But I don't think it would really be possible to implement this mode in today's project culture. It just wouldn't, uh, just wouldn't happen. It wouldn't make it through. And that's a sh it's a good thing we, you know, me and Matt implemented most of this in 2012 because things have changed. So I, needed, I still needed to launch Lighthouse, so what did I do? Um, I made a uh, patch set on top of Bitcoin Core. I called it Bitcoin XT. I don't know what XT stands for. It, it might be extra, experimental. I don't know. It could be any of those things. But it's basically Bitcoin Core plus features that, you know, could be in there, but because of this political disaster zone and are not, 
And then a program called Cartographer, which is a program that explores the Bitcoin network and maps it out and allows you to find nodes which are offering more services than the, the typical nodes are. Um, <coughs> and I don't know if anything will really, if this will really go anywhere. Like I said, it's only got two extra features in currently. But if someone does come along and they want to, you know, add more features to the Bitcoin wire protocol, then they could do it as part of that project. Um, that probably added at least another month of delay, probably more. And currently it's only small, but we've got like more than 16 nodes. So very small compared to, you know, the, the 7,000 or whatever that run Bitcoin Core. But, you know, it's okay. It's enough. That's plenty of, that's plenty sufficient capacity to make Lighthouse work. So that's okay from my perspective. So conclusion, adding something to the Bitcoin protocol, well, technically it makes sense, right? I mean, you can, you can run Lighthouse with a copy of full, a full Bitcoin node locally if you want, and it will use it, and you'll get the full security of like the classical Bitcoin model where you download everything and spend like three, five hours you know, indexing and auditing the blockchain. You can do that. But if you don't want to, you can rely on this feature instead. Um, and you know, I think this is technically correct, but it did waste large amounts of time. And what will this mean? Well, what, <laughs> you know, realistically what this means is that in future people making decentralized apps, quote, uh, won't bother trying to extend the Bitcoin protocol if they need to. They'll just use blockchain Info or chain.com or one of these API providers where they actually like development. <laughs> <coughs> so this is, you know, the other lessons learned of building, uh, the, the, the key takeaways I want developers to get when they want to build decentralized things. Um, specialized desktop Java wallets are easy to build. I didn't have many problems with it at all. And you know, it works, right? It was easy enough to use. All kinds of people have been able to use it. And people said it looked good. It's got WYSI animations. I didn't show you on this. <coughs> um, uh, the animations are smoother when you don't have like massive numbers of projects in it, by the way. Uh, yeah, so the hard part really is actually the state management and UI sync and Peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, you, you have conflicting information coming in. Um, some nodes see things at different times to others, so creating a coherent UI out of this is a bit of a pain. Um, and yeah, just, just really focus and spend time up front on product design. Uh, leave the crypto to the very end. Force yourself, right? It's like eating the, the meat before the vegetables kind of thing. Even though that's the fun thing, which is one of the reasons, you know, people like me are interested in this stuff, actually just figuring out should email addresses be public or private? Like right at the front, that uh, will save a lot of time. That's not a unique insight by any means, right? But I need to say it anyway. <coughs> yeah, and then decentralize as little as possible, but not too little. And then, uh, yeah, there's Bitcoin XT, so think about that. And that's, that's my talk. We went through it pretty quick. So thank you for listening, and uh, I hope that was interesting. Probably more interesting to developers than other people, so I apologize for that. But uh, these are the experiences I wanted to communicate about that. Thank you. So basically, when you withdraw your pledge, you spend the like UTXO. Yeah. Yeah, when, when you pledge money, it's still yours in your wallet. Um, you just give them like a conditional claim. Mm -hmm. and revoking it spends the money back to yourself. Mm -hmm. So it invalidates the, uh, invalidates the claim. Yeah, thanks for your talk. I think it was very interesting to see your personal experience on this project. What do you think is the main kind of project that is well suited for Lighthouse? Um, I would say. Uh, projects in countries where you can't use the existing solutions, like Kickstarter and Indiegogo have very strict geographical requirements if you want to raise money. Um, so, you know, if you're wanting to raise money in parts of Latin America, for example, you could use Lighthouse and Bitcoin to do that because it works everywhere. Uh, small crowdfunds, but it doesn't really make sense to have a full-blown project. So there have been a few successful Lighthouse crowdfunds so far. Um, one was a charity one that I did as a demo. We raised um, 3.5 bitcoins for charity. Another one was uh, uh, the uh, South Korean Bitcoin meetup raised snack money for their meetup. Believe it or not. So this is an example like a micro crowdfund that doesn't really make sense. With the existing things. Um, you can use it for things like so. One of the reasons I kept serverless mode, even though it was a bit of a pain in the ass, is uh, 
you know, you could you could send an email to your friends saying, hey, let's go play laser tag, but we need at least 10 people for it to be fun. So each person replies with an email and attached to the email is their pledge for like that ticket. And then you get enough, if you get enough tickets, then someone will group by. So there you don't even have a web page, right? It's all over email. Um, so, you know, I think there are use cases for this where we don't currently do crowdfunding. We could, but I don't know. Yeah, so one of the How reasons, do you think we as a society can handle that problem? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole, one of the reasons I did Lighthouse is to try and solve that problem of how do you fund decentralized development, right? Uh, which is ironic because uh, Lighthouse was sort of funded out of a mix of my savings and a philanthropic grant from the rich point. Mm -hmm. My original plan before Olivier came along was to release Lighthouse as like a proprietary uh, app that took fees per project and then have a crowdfund for the release of it as a um, and yeah, we didn't do that as open source for the start. But uh, the idea is, you saw with BitSquare, they tried, they they wanted to raise a lot of money and they were kind of an unproven team, right? No one's using their software currently, so that was a bit ambitious, maybe. But that's the kind of thing. Everyone chips in $10 and we get a decentralized, whatever. We'll see if it works, I don't know. Economic theory says it might work, but we'll have to do this. The, the, the community of people who are interested Advertising for what we like for the internet, the thing that really made well, come alive was advertising. And what is that? What is that magic ingredient that will actually build this whole ecosystem? That's my question. Yeah, the decentralized stuff. Yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe crowdfunding, meetup. You know, it, it's hard to say. At the moment, it's venture capital. I haven't um, heard about it at all, so I'll just ask some stupid questions. I'm sure I could read about them. Uh, when I studied the topic, when I get home, but <coughs> uh, let's assume that uh, that I did uh, such a project. There would be an easy way to determine the state of the progress on the on the funding. I don't have to like traverse the entire blockchain to find out. No, no. Okay. Uh, you said there was some kind of how how does that work exactly? Well, so in the app, if you create a project, then um, you know it appears in the, the app, and then if you see the blue bar with the little circle sort of, you know, it goes up and you can see the, the pledges on the right hand side. But what if I want to export this status to, let's say, a website? Yeah, so uh, if you are using the server system, load the server has uh, like a JSON thing, you can load a JavaScript query and it will tell you how much money you've raised so far. And I assume that uh, if you reach your goal, then uh, um, some kind of funds are released to uh, whatever Bitcoin address you <coughs> put into the project, yeah. right? Will yeah. you, in that uh, uh, transaction, be able to see uh, the, um, the the public keys that actually donated? Yeah. Yeah, it appears on the blockchain. You can see it in the public spot. Okay. Cool. Is there a way to like search directly on the integrity of the project file? Some attacker could just copy all the projects and separate it. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, no. It was designed to make that possible in the future. So, uh, the Lighthouse project is actually, I don't know if you've heard of BIP70. This is, yeah, the payment protocol. It's how we solve this problem for Bitcoin payments. Make sure you pay who you think you're paying. Lighthouse uh, file format is an extended version of that. So, we can use exactly the same techniques and infrastructure uh, for digital signing of projects if we want to. It's not uh, part of the current project because, again, it got defocused to be able to solve the core problem. We'll see if any of these substitution attacks really happen, but they're not an issue right now. You can't edit other people's Reddit posts, for example. Yeah. Uh, do you want to ask me to say yeah? And how are the deadlines enforced? There are no deadlines. Wasn't, wasn't there a deadline that this project was oh, completely completed? That, that was like a deadline where they said, if you don't get this money by this date, we'll just give up. Ah, it's and the then, thing. Yeah, that software has no deadline. So um, they basically said, we give up. Uh, if you've got a pledge, just click the vote in the app and you'll get the money back whenever you want it back. Do you know how many is sick any anyone can pay transactions on the blockchain right now already? How many? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Not that many, I don't think. How do you
do you think uh, a business or somebody starting a project will deal with a big price fluctuation over a month or two? Yeah, so I faced that myself when I wanted to, you know, I was thinking about how can I raise money for my own projects this way. And what I came up with is um, a website where people can um, express interest, and it's literally just a web form where they say, I would be willing to pledge $20. Um, and it just goes into Facebook, it's no money, but this is no authentication, you can pledge whatever you want. And then the idea is, if it looks like you will have enough in dollars, then you try and do the crowdfunding Bitcoin so a short amount of time. But you, yeah, you're right. It's not really a good idea to do like a two month long crowdfunding to the Bitcoin crowd. You can't change the amount of time when it starts. Can you basically uh, enforce blocking the pledge uh, to enforce the deadline? Can we do enforce the pledge cannot be withdrawn? Um, well, so, yeah, you can imagine a future version of the protocol and follow it that would allow that. Um, with Lighthouse, when you pledge, no one else actually holds the money. You don't actually rely on anyone else. So there, there's no one who can stop you from taking the money back because it's still yours. Yeah, I mean, uh, can you, I mean, if it was like, <coughs> so that you can enforce that if somebody committed some money, mm -hmm. you cannot take it back. Until? Uh, until sometimes. So basically you can send your money to a multi-seek address, mm -hmm. and then you sign, you pre-sign a transaction from this multi-seek address to anyone, anyone you can pay. Yeah. And then create a lock time transaction as well. Yes, you can do that. And this is like, the, you can enforce the deadline. Yeah, yes, you can definitely do that. But I didn't because it's not clear to me, yeah, it's not clear to me to what extent the deadline feature of sites like Kickstarter is about keeping their sites cluttered, you know, without being cluttered up with lots of long projects, and to what extent it's a fundamental part of the problem. Yeah, it just can happen that uh, somebody can spam project with fake, um, Ledges mm -hmm. and then withdraw all of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so people did bring this up when I, you know, I talked to people about design. Like, oh, what if someone trolls you by committing lots of money and then taking it away at the last minute? Uh, very risky approach to troll. Because of course, if someone, <laughs> <laughs> if someone else uh, puts in the last amount of money, they you know, take all the money. Yeah, the creator itself can do that. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's and then yeah, the creator themselves can do that. So they could actually uh, have the last laugh. Um, yeah, I would be very surprised if we see this kind of thing happening. It, it could be a potential future improvement is that optional um, locking uh, system. Yeah. All the donation matched the final um, amount. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. One, one of the things the server does is prevent people pledging mm -hmm. too much money. If you've gathered too many pledges, then the additional money would Responsibility does the person have to follow through? So um, yeah, so done, done basically. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, when, when you are, it depends on the kind of project, right? So for uh, crowdfunding, usually you are, there's people asking for money in order to do something. I think a better way of doing this is for someone to do something, well, in the software space, to actually write the software and then hold it to ransom and say, I'll release the software if I get the money. That's obviously, it shifts to risk from the buyer to the seller. Um, what you can do, of how Lighthouse works is you can have a dispute mediated um, contract. So you can do this in two ways. One is to have a multi sig the, the contract goes to a multi sig address and mediate it's the main budget committee and they have to agree to release the money. That's kind of annoying because you know money is held by the committee in the interim period, so that's not quite, you know, they, it's not quite as good. Uh, what you can also do is create a project and then give it to a different person who's running the project server. So someone else is collecting the pledges. Um, separate collection of pledges from ownership of the final money of this phase. And then the project's operator is the only person who can like, hit the claim button. Um, or no, sorry, the person who created the project is the only person who can hit the claim button. So then they only finalize the contract when they're satisfied with the person who's most people aren't doing that today. Most people are saying, give me money to do something cool. <laughs> so it's yeah. Most of the arguments, like, why, because I, I don't see any reason why not to have such a thing, like, get the XO and get the paper as well. You know, you can meet the thread if you want. So, <laughs> <coughs> some of the, like, the very first post was by uh, 
I don't want to name names, by a guy who's famous for trolling, let's say, and uh, it's, it's, he, he, uh, he was like, oh, Lighthouse doesn't need this, but he didn't know how the app worked, it wasn't public at that time. So, you know, he spent like a good 10 or 20 posts trying to convince me that my design was wrong, and eventually he was like, oh, actually, yeah, you do need it. So, he wasted a, a huge amount of time. Um, there are other people who are like, it's not secure, the remote peer could lie. Lighthouse does lots of queries in parallel with pairs of results. Um, to try and catch that, but it's true, you know, I mean, to some extent you can't know if the result is genuinely valid. <coughs> the only time that's going to be really be an issue is if your whole internet connection is hacked, and most people are fundraising from home, right, so it's like, in practice, probably not a problem, but this was like another 100 comments, and, you know, at one point, uh, Amir Taki turned up and was like, you need to keep the protocol pure, <laughs> like, you don't even use the protocol, right? <laughs> Dark wallet does its own thing, so why do you care? Yeah, I don't think lots of people are going to switch to Bitcoin XT. I mean, it doesn't even have a real website. But yeah, like in theory, Bitcoin XT is Bitcoin Core plus two things. And so it, people can switch and everything is going to work. What's, what's the other? Uh, yeah. uh, that's double spend relay. So that's learning about double spends. Um, you know, today, like payment processors and blockchain explorers will, do, will like, connect to lots of peers to learn about double spends. But if you are selling something, Usually what's been happening is I did prototype code and then other people like did extra stuff on top of it and that's what it got, I got integrated. So um, my name is not on all of the commits I worked on traditionally. Uh, but mostly I've done SPVs towards and full upgrades for like the wallets. I'm not gonna do that anymore. But the, 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 what's the reason? Yeah, Bruce filtering was like I've been talking about it for I don't know a year and a half and one day Matt Val I would like turn up was like, yeah, I had my lectures were boring, so I implemented this in my lectures. <laughs> he like implemented blue filtering, so we um, we worked on that together. You know, I wrote a bit with him. We, we made some tweaks to the protocol together. And that code, yeah, that's that that got in pretty pretty straightforward. You know, no other minor things that um, lightweight wallets needed. And I didn't even write the code necessarily. I sometimes I just asked for them, and other people were able to them. And those same people now are like, only oh, idiots who design a protocol that way. <laughs> so, like, they, <laughs> you wrote the code like just two years ago. Um, yeah, so we'll see what the future best. Last year, they were mostly um, students or employees elsewhere. They weren't doing Bitcoin stuff full time, and that's now fixed. Actually, all those people are now, yeah, by by venture capital basically. Um, they are now all gainfully employed doing Bitcoin related stuff full time. So that's that's good. that's cool. Um, that's helped. But one problem is we don't have a new supply of these people turning up and being developed, right? <coughs> because they get flamed and told they're idiots. And but most people who see the stuff, they're just like, I'm not taking it, I'm just walking away. Why would I, why would I put myself up for this? Can you explain more about how these uh, embedded transactions work? And I say, like, what kind of guarantees do I have? And I, can I make a pledge then? Do I have a guarantee that it will only go through when the full amount and is just finally collected? Is that part of this contract? Or? Yeah, well, if you didn't have enough pledges, then you would be trying to create money out of nothing, yeah. right? And the, the Bitcoin network would ignore you. Okay. So, Explain this, this pledge. Is it held in an escrow or is it just no. like a multi sig? That's it's not escrow, it's not multi sig. It's okay. using this other feature of Bitcoin that no one's talked about until now, really, except me because no one's been using it. Um, and it's this thing where the Bitcoin network is <coughs> enforces the rules of crowdfunding effectively. Like every Bitcoin node has this logic in them, so you don't need to be more related to the network. Is it like a 
Russell signature? Is it, what are we talking about? <coughs> what kind of? Sorry, maybe it's. Um, it's called an EMP. Yeah, maybe yeah. I should have actually got a, an ex example of Block Explorer that I can show you. It looks like a regular transaction on the blockchain, uh -huh. but um, so okay. So you know, transactions have inputs and outputs. Right. So an, in an input refers to another output. It contains a signature, which allows you to claim it. And an output contains other people's keys. So you're claiming money, and then you're you're, you're combining bitcoins and you're splitting them up again with new owners. Okay. Um, a pledge is a, um, a transaction that has an input of, say, 0 0.1 bitcoins and an output of, say, 10 bitcoins. Right? Not valid. Can't do it. Bitcoin will reject that because um, if you didn't, the whole thing would be meaningless. You could just give yourself money. Um, and what this special feature allows you to do is normally that transaction would be frozen in this invalid state. It would just be a broken piece of data. It would be useless. But by signing it in a special way, you say, you can actually take these transactions, all the inputs, all these different Margin transactions, add them all together. And now you've got a, a final transaction that has like you know 20 inputs, all these different pledges, still one output. So now it all balances, and when the numbers balance, you can broadcast it and the money moves. So do do the does the network RAM actually hold these in memory while it's waiting? Like how do you compare with Arpan transactions? Like no, so the, the partial invalid transactions are held by like the pledge server, the, the project servers. The, oh, the so you like don't them. release it to the network till the thing is ready. Sorry? Yeah, the, the Bitcoin network won't accept these things. Um, you have to do it. That's one of the things that the project servers are doing. So it's, 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 like it's, like it's like in a lot of time. Okay, but you just hold it yourself till it's ready. Yeah. So, so it's kind of untouch. Of course. What happens if you overcome a goal? Uh, you can't. So uh, let's say, <coughs> so, so the last person to, uh, to pledge has to pledge the exact yes. amount. So the app queries the project server and says how much money is left, and it won't let you pledge more than that. If, if, you, uh, if you try, the UI will turn red and you won't be able to push the button. And the server checks as well, if someone bypasses that, the server will reject it, so you, they, won't, they won't allow you to over collect. Otherwise, the money will ever go to my fees, which is pointless. Very remote pledge, um, so that means it costs me some minor fee yeah. to a rope. Yeah. But you could also implement pledge at a certain validity time, that, that that be possible. Let's say I make a pledge, it's valid for three weeks. If it's not collected, then this transaction will be, it's, it's not going anywhere. Um, and, the, and the other person cannot merge it anymore, so I don't need to take it out. Yeah, yeah with the existing Bitcoin protocol, that's a bit awkward. No way of doing it, as was suggested before, but it involves even more transactions.
this also I'm talking to some investors who are, you know, they would like to support Lighthouse to help grow the Bitcoin economy and things. So I'm still, yeah, I'm still figuring out what I'm going to work on next. I've got a bunch of ideas, and we'll see. And have you said about geography, like, like first entering? Is that the Africa, or is it actually important, or do you want to launch worldwide? Uh, to, to do, yeah, so to get more usage worldwide, I would need to actually have made the app translatable. At the moment, it's can't translate it into other languages. Um, yeah, I mean, we could do like a Spanish version. 